you. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, to those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, we hope you find this session fruitful as well. So on today's plan, um, of course, we're just going to talk briefly about Sharpies if you're not aware of it. Then, of course, we're going to look at the basics and then, of course, the topics which are really why we're here, um, from the trigonometry, graphs, and general and specific solutions, number patterns, and then functions. Now, uh, when we originally did this session, it, it took just over an hour, um, but I'm gonna condense a little bit because a, lot of, a, a little bit of it is repeti repetitious. So don't panic. Uh, oh, hello, Orwell, thank you so much. Uh, we will um, definitely Go through it and then if you do have questions feel free to just stop me and let's jump in it's always fun to have interactive um, sessions with teachers and students for those who are students who are joining us all right so what is sharpies if you don't know sharpies is a maths teacher reward program just for maths teachers um, and you can earn points just for attending this webinar so for those of you who are sharpies now you'll get 20 points for being here um, once you have collected enough points you can exchange your points or gifts. So I've just put up some pictures of the gifts that are available. This is not it. There are lots more. And so you've got headphones and bags and laptop bags. If you change your stationary list or you purchase calculators from us, you will also get points for that. If you tell your friends about Sharpies, you will get points. So there's lots of easy ways um, to earn points. Awesome. Then, of course, our free resources and downloads that we will go through. This is the link to the simulator. It's free to download off Maths at Sharp. If you just click on it, it will automatically download the simulator for you. And it's the one that we're going to use today. And then, of course, GeoGebra, which I actually just recently downloaded. And I will talk about more uh, about that in a little bit when we hit the trigonometry. And then, of course, you know, Maths at Sharp for all the free worksheets for grade 8 to 12 maths, technical maths, and math literacy. Uh, eClassroom has a subscription fee, which I will confirm in the next newsletter for everybody. And then, of course, mathwarehouse.com um, has got some wonderful practice worksheets for FET. So it just slips through those because they are American, um, but they do have some lovely things if you're looking for a lot of repetition. And then, of course, if you still need the ATP maths documents, they are available on Maths at Sharp. I've just taken all of the maths ones and put them to an easy to find page in PDF format. Um, so that you've got quick access to them as well. So, and everything we're covering today is part of the ATP documents right in there as well. All right, so this is the calculator that we're going to be using today, the Sharp ELW535SA. We're gonna spend a lot of time in our normal mode and our table mode. We're not doing any statistics today. Um, and then of course, drill function is just a really fun function for practicing your mental maths. Now, when you get your calculators, you can play around with drill and you'll see what I mean. All right, awesome. So let's jump straight into it. Trigonometry, here we come. Okay, so what I wanted to do is to start off with just a basic um, trigonometry graph. And what I'm doing is I'm going to my table mode and I'm just gonna type in a sign very basic sound graph, so grade 10 minimum, basic, basic. And I'm just going to plot my points. So I'll start at negative 180. And then I can make my steps one if I'm being um, masochistic, or I can make my steps 15 for a little bit more space. You can still see the curve nicely with steps of 15. And also when you're doing shifts, um, steps of 15 are also very helpful because we tend to shift in 30, 45, or 60, you know, which is all um, multiples of 15. So if you have 15, you'll be able to see that shift quite nicely as well. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's come back and just look at what we've done here. So here is your table with all of your coordinates. Now, even though we started at negative 180, we can still go back up past that. So don't panic. And then um, obviously, some of the points are not going to be so pretty or easy to plot, but you can see what I mean by steps of 15. Um, so you can see that we can. Now, what I did is I went and plotted these coordinates for you on GeoGebra. So here's all your points. Um, oh, so before we get into that, I went 
and discovered that my GeoGebra was really old. So I downloaded a new version, which I must say is pretty epic. And while I was fiddling around with GeoGebra, I discovered this. Now this is a GeoGebra classroom. And basically what it allows you to do is to create or find an activity. Um, and then you can create a class and your students can all join your class through GeoGebra and then do all of this, this activity together, which is really awesome. Um, so if you, I will send this um, presentation to you on Monday as a PDF uh, and it will have all the links available. So if you click on this picture, it will literally link you to this page and then you can start doing your creator classroom and all of that sort of stuff. And then of course, these are all the different resources that GeoGebra has. Again, you can see it's also linked. So if you click on the picture, it will take you to this um, link over here. And then you can see 2,200 different resources for between grade six and grade 12, maths, which is really phenomenal. I mean, obviously not all of them we can use because some of our maths is a little bit different, but I mean, there's so much stuff here that's really helpful. So have fun playing with that. Then when I started drawing the graph on GeoGebra, I decided to just plot a sine x graph, just to get the general idea of the shape. And it was a nightmare, <laughs> because what happened is it, it plots the graph in radians instead of in degrees. So you have to go and change the settings for the graph. Um, so here are your steps to do that. Uh, and then you can see it's actually double degrees, some of my um, steps. So it's really quite difficult. Uh, just to draw a, a trick graph in GeoGebra. But if you plot the coordinates, it's not so bad. So what I did is I took all of the coordinates from the table mode that we were in, and I just sort of plotted them along the Cartesian plane for you to see. Now, another thing to note with, with if you're using GeoGebra is that you shouldn't use a semicolon. You should use I just want to point this, this is the semicolon, you should only use a comma. If you use a semicolon, it's going to change the units and then it skews your graph completely and does all sorts of weird things. So just a heads up on that, uh, make sure to use a comma and not a semicolon. And then of course, you can just connect the dots. Now, I'm hoping that I will draw this beautifully for you. This is my um, fourth round of this, so I should be better at it. Yay! Yay me. Um, no, I'm kidding. But uh, so there you can see the nice curve. It's not giving you the shark teeth um, that we see when we only plot negative nine, uh, 180 and 90. If you just join, uh, sorry, you're not going to see any good shocks here. But do you know what I mean? Um, that's when the kids don't give yourself, they don't give themselves enough of a step um, between the points and then they get the shocks. So just a, a heads up. All right, so then what we did is we decided to look at the effects of A because you, you do need to investigate it. Uh, and this, this is quite a fun way to do it. So we may as well try. So I've left the original sine function in my first graph. And in my second graph, I'm just going to multiply the sine function by two. Okay, and then I can leave my start and step as is. And we can just scroll through the table quickly. And you can see that everything is multiplied by two. I mean, this is an easy one to see. Uh, let's go look for another nice easy one. There you go. You can see negative one times two is two and negative half times two is negative one and so on. And again, we went and plotted those coordinates for you. So here is my original graph, which is just this blue one here. And you can see it just bounces between um, zero and one. And then for my new graph with, with the two sine x, I did it in red so you can see the difference in the coordinates. You can see it bounces now between negative two. Please forgive my draw graph drawing, it's terrible. It bounces between uh, negative two at the bottom here and two at the top here. And you can see your points are exactly times two apart. Uh, obviously, zero times two will still be zero. So that's, you can see these points stay the same but these points in the middle are stretched. So our A changes the size of our wave. Okay, and we'll come back to that because the next example, we look at when A is a half. Okay, so again, I'm doing exactly the same thing on the calculator. I'm not gonna go back to it because you sort of get the idea. And then again, I'm gonna plot the points. Okay, so here's my new graph because I'm already got red. 
and you can see it's a tiny little red one. And then if we make it blue, here's my original one. And you can see that now the graph is half the size of my original graph. So A determines the size of your wave and how far down your um, the peaks of your waves are gonna be. Okay, so my peak is a half and, and negative a half. Sorry, other way around, negative a half and a half, but you know what I mean. Um, so uh, it's really just nice to, to draw this with them and to show them step by step what's actually going on. Now you can also investigate the shift up and down. Uh, again, I'm not gonna do it on the table. You sort of know what we're doing here. And then I'm just gonna show you quickly what color blue. blue. Okay, so here is my original graph. And uh, here is my new graph with my shift, which was plus one. Oh, sorry. I'm not a good graph drawer. <laughs> so there's your shift plus one. And you can see every single gap between the coordinates is one every time. One unit, one unit, one unit. Oh, my is not oh, very terrible here. Yeah. One unit and so on and so forth. So uh, that's quite a nice way to, to see the shift up and down. And then of course your shift left and right as well. So remember here that your, oh, sorry that your formula is x minus p, right? When you put it and then your ratio here. Okay, so when we put in, say for example, x plus 30 and we make it equal to zero, it's actually x is equal to negative 30. So here our shift is actually to the left. And then when I have x minus 30, in my ratio so that x minus 30 is equal to zero, then I have x is equal to 30. So then my shift is to the right. So that's just something to pay attention to when you are doing um, shifts left and right. I know this is grade 11 and grade 12 work that we cover for maths, okay. So again, on your calculator, you can, on your um, picture, Here's my original graph. You'd think I'd get better at this, but apparently not. Um, and here is my new graph with my shift. And you can see that it has shifted exactly 30 degrees, 30 degrees to the left. Now, some of my points I didn't plot because they weren't nice, pretty points. Um, but you can see exactly here. Again, your shift is 30 degrees as well. So, are we all good and happy with these? Any questions before I move on to solving trig? Thanks, Anna. Okay, great, fantastic. Oh, I see a, I see a question quickly. Okay, Ijawa says he's also happy. Great, fantastic, thanks guys. So let's move on then and let's look at solving equations. So I've put the cost of diagram in because it is actually really important. And also you need to be able to, you need to know the theory of the trig graphs before you can come and solve equations because a lot of that theory comes into play when you are doing these equations, okay? Um, so the first thing is remember to start from the furthest point away from X and remember that your X is enclosed by your trig ratio. So things next to the X, uh, for example, um, sign for X, the trig ratio is further away from the X than the four. So you need to deal with the sign ratio first before dealing with the inside of the trig ratio. That makes sense. Okay. And then remember how often your graphs repeat. So sine and cos repeats every 360 degrees and tan repeats every 180 degrees. So <clears throat> what we, I did then is I took a couple of questions from, I think it's the grade 11 uh, term to revision worksheet, worksheet 13. Um, and I looked at how to answer these. Okay. Now, I didn't look at the memo the first time I set this up. So there was some confusion, but I fixed it since then. So we're all good. All right. So, firstly, we can see that the three is the furthest thing away from sine. So we're going to divide by three. And now we have sine x plus 30 is equal to one third. So now we can see x plus 30 is one whole thing, and we're going to get rid of the sine first. So we're going to take the inverse of sine, and it's going to give us this angle 90 degrees. Okay. 
Now our reference angle is x plus 30 is equal to 19.47 degrees. And sine means that we need to add K 360. So our general solution, um, so remember we started with X plus 30 is equal to 19.47 degrees plus K 360. Then we take the 30 to the other side and we are left with negative 10.53 degrees plus K 360. Now with sine, remember that your graph has an up and a down. So it goes through points, right? It goes through two points um, per cycle of that graph. So here we need to say 180 minus our reference angle and then take the 30 to the other side plus K360. So our second general solution is going to be 130.53 uh, plus K360. Now what I discovered, um, which is really nice to do on your calculator, is to actually put your general solution into your table mode. So I'm going to use negative 10 0.53 plus, and then of course, instead of saying K, we're just going to say X times 360, okay? And then for our second one, we'll put our second general solution, which is 130.53 plus X instead of K, same thing, uh, times 360. Uh, it's just a variable, basically, and we've only got one. So we can do it like that and equals. Now, obviously we don't want to start at negative 180 because that will give us astronomically high values or astronomically low values, depending on how you look at it. So we're going to just change this value to negative one. And then of course our step, because now we're substituting in integers of K, we're going to make our step one and we're going to press equals. And here we go. Now we're looking for solutions between 30 degrees and 200 degrees. So if we look, that's too small. The, this one is also too small. If we go back here, this one is too small. This one is perfect. So that is a specific solution. And if we go down again, we can see that one's too big. It's higher than 200 degrees. So we ignore it. And in fact, our only specific solution is 130.53 degrees. Okay. So it's a really nice way to do your um, specific solution. And it really helps for those students who struggle with substitution. Now, if we look at the second example, we're going to follow exactly the same steps. We're going to take the two to the other side first, then we're going to divide by five, and we've got cos 4x is equal to two fifths. Now we're solving for 4x because it's the inside of our trig ratio. So we just say second function cos, which gives us arc cos, and then we put our fraction in and we say equals. So we have 4x is equal to 66.42 degrees. Now for our general solution, we have two options. We have um, 360 minus our reference angle, and we have, here we go. 360 minus our reference angle and 360 plus our reference angle, okay? But it's all equal to 4x. And then of course we add our K360s because our graph repeats every 360 degrees. Here we just simplified it and then divided everything by four. So our first general solution is 73.395 plus K90 because when you do a 4x, it bounces the inside of your graph. Um, quite a lot. And then, of course, the second one is 106.605 plus K90. Okay. So, from this, um, again, we are going to put it all into our table. Um, and you can see I've just actually done all the solutions here for you. So, I'm not going to go back to the calculator. You sort of get the idea. Uh, and then we go and look for solutions between negative. Uh, 180 and between 300. So this one is too small, so we ignore it. The next one is negative 163, so that's this one here, and then negative 106, negative 73, negative 16, plus 16, and then positive 73, positive 106, positive 163, positive 196, 253, and 286. And here we can see we've gone over 300. So we are all done. So this one had a lot of um, specific solutions, whereas the previous one just had one. And that's just because our graph was packed really tightly into it. Okay. Then again, I've done another one for tan. So I, I'm, I'm not going to go too hectically through it to sort of get the idea. Um, 
And then of course with tan, your graph only repeats every 180. So you only have one specific or general solution. And that's because your graph doesn't repeat itself. Um, you draw the graph like that. So you can see there's no repetition anywhere along your graph. You just have one value per um, space, per x. So, or one value per y, whichever way you're looking around at. Okay, and then again, we can look at our specific solution and we can see between zero and 270, the only correct answer is 116. So we know we are all finished and we can move on. Uh, cool, sorry, I've done the wrong thing. Are there any questions? Are you happy with this before we move on to number patterns? Feeling good? I haven't complicated it more, have I? <laughs> All right, fantastic. I don't see any questions popping up. Uh, so this is a cover of the grade 10 number patterns textbook or study guide. I see, hang on, I see a question. No worries, Janie, thanks for joining us. Um, so this is our grade 10 textbook uh, study guide for patterns. If you click on this picture, it will take you through to a link where you can download the grade 10 study guide. Uh, really nice for the students to use also extra questions, memos and notes and so on and so forth. So there are three types of number patterns. In grade 10, we deal with linear and geometric without obviously dealing with the, the formula as we know it in grade 12. Then of course you have the quadratic formula which we deal with in grade 11. And I'll show you a really nice shortcut for this one as well. Okay, so linear patterns, you need to think straight lines. Uh, and someone showed me a really epic example here, where all you do is you just reverse one more space backwards. And um, so you find the common difference. So the common difference here is three, right? Three plus 11 is 14. Three plus 14 is 17. Now if I reverse, oh, sorry. I don't know why it's doing this funny stuff. Three plus, uh, 11 minus three will give me eight. So eight is the y-intercept. I'm putting this in inverted commas, but you can't see me. Um, eight is the um, y-intercept of the graph. Okay, so I can fill this in here. That's, and there we go, that's eight there. So what we know is that our starting position before we add three for our first term, so that's gonna be that one, is eight. And then we found the linear, um, formula. It's really nice for grade 10 and grade 9 in fact as well because they don't need to know this um, dn plus c formula so much. Okay then the next one we can look at is the gym. Uh, oh so then what I did is I put this all into a table uh, just the formula and I went and checked what uh, whether or not my solution is correct. So we can go do that quickly. Um, so I'm twice, then 3x plus 8 equals, uh, let's take that one away because it's not relevant. And then, of course, we can make our start 1 because our term position started 1, okay? And equals, and we can see there's 11, 14, 17, and then we can find the rest of our terms by just scrolling through the table. So if we wanted to know what the 20th term is, we can just go find x is 20. And we can say it is 68. Uh, it's also really nice to check. Say, for example, we want to know, do you think 100 is part of the sequence? So what we can do here is just go look whether 100 is in here. No, it's not. So 100 is not part of the sequence. Uh, and then we can uh, move forward from there. So it's really a nice checking mechanism. I mean, the table mode is just so handy. And because it's unlimited, you can do so much stuff with it, which is really great. I'm getting excited. Okay, <laughs> so uh, geometric patterns is when you multiply by the same ratio uh, or the same value every single time. So three times what gives me 12, and that's four. So I have four here. And then 12 times four gives me 48, and 48 times 100 minus two. So our common ratio is four, and our first term is three. And then we know that our formula, if we just substitute it in, is 3 times 4 to the power of n minus 1. Okay, so that's it for, for geometric patterns. Again, you can go and check that it's correct by typing it into your table mode and checking your answers or your 
um, factors, term, term values. Sorry, that's a better way of putting it. And then, of course, you have the quadratic um, pattern, which I think is the one that most students struggle the most with, especially because they don't link the idea of a quadratic pattern to the parabola. And it's exactly the same thing, except you're not seeing the full image of the parabola. You're only seeing half of the parabola because it's cut off. Okay, so your turning point is still at zero. Um, and then you just have that formula or well, your turning point, in fact, could be anywhere along that graph, depending on your equation, actually. Okay, so there's two possible methods. The first is this one, which I was taught at um, a master maths when I was tutoring there. And that's just A plus B plus C is equal to your first term. 3A plus B is equal to your first difference, this one here. And 2A is equal to your second difference. And you can see this is your uh, common difference. And then this is a linear pattern. And then the pattern above it would be a um, quadratic pattern or you can use simultaneous equations, depending on what you are most comfortable with. So this method is just a basic substitution and solve, and you always solve from the bottom to the top. So we have two A is equal to three, so we know A is equal to three over two. And then of course we have, um, we substitute the three over two into our A value for this equation, and we find B is negative two and a half. And then, of course, we substitute both of those values into our third top equation and we solve for b. So we get b equals 2, and then we put it into our formula here. Right. Your second method is to work backwards to find c. So I'm actually going to use my pen here. So here, what plus 3 will give me 2? Well, that's minus 1. And what plus minus 1 will give me 1? Well, that's 2. Right, so that works for our pattern. So this is actually our C value over here, just like we did with the linear pattern as well. Okay, so it works exactly the same way. I really like this method for those kids who really struggle uh, with remembering that A plus B plus C, 3A plus B and 2A. Um, it took me a long time <laughs> to remember that. So I don't blame them at all. Then of course, you just substitute your C in, which is two, and you substitute your first two terms in. So your term, n is one and your term value is one and then you and then your second one which is the term value is three and your term position is two and of course you solve for all a, a and b and it sorry should give you exactly the same answers as we got previously it's a slightly longer method um but it does give you exactly the same answers i haven't actually written out the formula it's just Bad answering. Okay, so we can also do the shortcut on the calculator. And I want to show you this because it is such a nice way to check your answers. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to our stats node and we're going to choose this line here, a plus bx plus cx squared. Okay, and then in our x column, we're going to put all of our term positions. And in our y column, we're going to put all of our term values. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, and 4 in this column, and then 1, 3, 8, and 16 in this column. Now there's two ways to do this. Either you can type 1, 2, 3, 4, go back up to the top of your Y column, type in those values, or you can type it in like this, which is my favorite way to do it. So uh, I, I feel like it's faster. You just press this X comma Y button, and then press 1, and all it does is it puts your coordinates into the table for you. So it's two and three. It's particularly nice if you're doing linear regression because you would enter your linear regression coordinates in exactly the same way. And then three and eight. And just for extras, four and 16. You only need three points um, in order to do this. But it's always nice to have an added extra for double checking. Okay, when you are done typing in your coordinates or your um, pattern, formula, you can just press change, and change just takes you to a calculation screen. If you press change, you can go back and check um, that everything is correct. You can write over anything. So if I wanted to change that eight to a nine, for example, I would just say nine. That's not right, so I'm gonna change it back to eight, but you sort of get the points of how easy it is to change stuff. All right, are you all ready? What we're gonna do is we're just gonna say alpha, and eight for our statistics menu. And we're gonna use the regression line, which is one. And that's it. Now, just a point here, 
uh, to note is look at your A, B, and C. So here your A is your y-intercept and your C is your uh, x squared coefficient. So when you, when you write it in, you need to be careful of your substitution. So just make a note of that. If the kids are gonna use this for checking the answers, they need to make sure that they're checking them the right way and it's not confusing them. Um, so just a heads up on that. What's also really nice is that you can use the stats mode to predict your values. So we're using extrapolation and interpolation in your parabola because we know um, exactly what's gonna happen. I just wanna go back to my slides because I have the right examples here. Um, here are all your steps. So don't panic if you wanna do this again in class. So say for example, um, we want to find the value of the fifth term. So we're looking for our y because it's our term value. So it's going to be second function. And here's a little y with the uh, prime on it. We just press a close bracket and it tells us our next term or our fifth term is 27. Now, if our term value is 188 and we want to find our term position, then what we're going to do is say second function. And now we're looking for x because it's our term position. There we go. So we can see our term position is 12. We know when we are doing these with patterns that we ignore the negative. So we can just easily check um, whether what our term position is. Now, uh, I've given you this really epic shortcuts, but it really is up to you how, if you want to use it in class. Um, I know some teachers don't feel comfortable giving these shortcuts out. Personally, uh, if I was a matric teacher, I'd probably only teach it to them in that revision week, <laughs> right before the final exams, so that they can feel a little bit more confident um, in themselves or in their answers. You know, you get those kids who just panic right at the end when it's final exams. So that's a nice way to just give them a little bit of a confidence boost and say, look, you can do it. Check your answers here. It's really easy. Also, then they don't know how to do that when um, you're marking their <laughs> tests in the meantime. Okay, any questions here before I move on to functions? We all good? Fantastic. All right. Great, great. Okay. So the functions that you need to cover for grade 10 and 11 are your straight line, which they did in grade nine, the parabola, the hyperbola, and the exponential graph. Now, these are all your matric final questions. Oh, thanks, Bazika. I'm glad you're okay. Awesome. Right. So um, some important terms just to make note of domain and range. Domain is all possible x values. Range is all your possible y values. And then I like to remember d is before r and x is before y. So d and x go together and range and y go together. Um, you know, these little mnemonics that you've always got to learn. Um, intercepts uh, are where your x is equal to zero and your y is equal to zero, other way around. y is equal to zero, x is equal to zero, and where they intersect on your axis. Okay. And then, of course, your asymptotes are these beautiful little electric fences. It's where your graph is trying to divide by zero. Now, obviously, we can't divide by zero, so we call this an asymptote, um, and it just it shows you where your graph is undefined. And I'll show you um, just now that on the calculator, it actually looks like an asymptote, so it's really nice uh, for those students. I've hit the share button far too soon. And then, of course, your axis of symmetry is the line that cuts the graph into two into a mirror image. And your turning points, which is actually only relevant to your parabola at this stage, is where your gradient changes sign. So when it changes from a positive to a negative or a negative to a positive. So basically only the parabola in grade 10 and 11. Okay. Now we can do the same sort of investigation that we did with our trigonometry graphs earlier. So I'm not going to go through all of the steps because you know um, sort of what I'm doing in table mode. And you can see my answers on the screen. So I'm just going to actually flick through. So the first um, graph that we're going to investigate is just your x squared, um, your parabola, just a basic x squared parabola, very basic. And then we're going to multiply that parabola by two in the second graph. And you can see here are all the coordinates down here, and we're going to plot them on the graph. Right, let me start with my original graph in blue. So here's my original parabola here. Sure. My mouse is really not happy. And here 
is my new parabola, which was multiplied by two. And you can see that each coordinate is multiplied by two above it. So it gets uh, closer together at the bottom because this, the values are smaller when you multiply them by two. And you can also see that because A is bigger than one, it's inside of this graph. So it's actually coming in towards the axis. Now, we can investigate when A is equal to half. So we're just going to change the second function here into half x squared and go and look for it. And here we can see, here is my new graph, which is the half x squared. And here is my original graph. And you can see that the new graph is smaller. I apologize for my drawings here. They are shockingly bad. Is um, thinner. So there's a lovely lady at Master Maths. Her name is Melanie in Mayersdale. And she likes to tell the kids for A, the effect of A is when you spend more time at gym, okay, you get skinnier. And when you spend less time at gym, in other words, when A is less than one and less than, uh, and between zero and one, it gets fatter. And then, of course, when A is negative, it is a sad face, which is this one here. I haven't shown it in these steps today, but you, I mean, it's exactly the same investigation. So you can go through those steps with your students as well and look at when A is negative. And then again, we can do the shift up and down exactly like we did with the trig graphs. And you can see here, I'm not gonna draw the graphs because I draw them so terribly, <laughs> but you can see here that it's exactly two between every single one. Okay, so that's a shift up by two. And if your cube is negative, it will shift downward and so on. Um, and then of course, shifting left and right. Now here, this is actually shifting your turning point to the left. And again, it's the same as that um, graph where we have X minus P as your original inside the brackets, okay? So if I have X plus three inside my brackets, um, then it's going to be x minus three, uh, x is equal to minus three. And so that means our shift is actually to the left. Oh, this is dreadful. Sorry, guys. I'm just going to actually try to fix this drawing up a little bit. Okay. So that's, and, and you can see here that every coordinate is just shifted across by three units. If we look, um, and our turning point is now sitting at negative three instead of at zero. So the whole graph. It's just shifted its whole bump, scooched over one seat. Um, and you can see the graph is exactly the same size. Uh, obviously, now that because it's shifted, you won't see the complete picture of the graph. But you, you do get the idea. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. So that's parabolas. And then what I've done is I've just created a summary for the parabola um, for you guys, and you can just use these notes. It is in PDF. If you want the original PowerPoint, just let me know. It's just a lot bigger than the PDF version. So uh, if you want it, just let me know and I'll email it individually to you as well. So again, if A is positive, it's a happy face. If A is negative, it's a sad face, you know, that, that sort of thing. The bigger the value of A, the thinner the parabola, in other words, when A is greater than one, and the smaller the value of A, in other words, when A is between zero and one, when it's a fraction, the fatter your parabola is. Now your domain is all possible X values, but your range will be um, cut off by the fact that you're turning your parabola turns. So it will either be like there or like so, and then it'll be above. Okay, so that's just the two things to note with your parabolas, etc. Cool. And then of course your intercepts, you can solve by factorizing. Your parabola doesn't have asymptotes. It only has one axis of symmetry, and that is your x turning point. So whatever your p-value is, whether it's zero or um, plus three or whatever, or negative three uh, in our example. Then, of course, for our turning point um, for grade tens, we just give them this formula. Where it comes from is when the uh, parabola is uh, differentiated and made equal to zero you get this, oh, sorry, you get this formula here. So <laughs> I'm really doing well here. You get this formula here. So that's where that one comes from. We just don't obviously share that with the grade 10s. We just give it to them as a turning point formula. 
And then of course, in grade 11, you have your turning points is given by P and Q, and you can find it by completing the square, or in fact, using your grade 10 formula as well, both are accepted. And then of course, in grade 12, you can also use the derivatives on your turning point or methods from grade 10 and 11. That's why the grade 12, um, you know, it's not so long at the end of the year. Okay, and then for the hyperbola, your grade 10 formula is just your A over X plus Q, and your grade 11 and 12 formula includes the shift left and right as well. Um, so again, I'm not going to do all of these steps, but what I do want to show you for the hyperbola is when you plot this um, graph, uh, let's go back to table mode. So when you plot this graph, Okay, on your on your table, uh, you're gonna get say for example we just a basic hyperbola like so, okay, and we say equals 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 equals. Okay, so there's my asymptote. Anything divided by zero is undefined. The asymptote actually looks like an asymptote. It says draw an asymptote here. Okay, and then uh, you can see that all of these plot points I've plotted on my original graph here, this one to blue, but it only comes up till negative one, and then it gives me the asymptote. So I don't know what's actually happening between this point and this point here. To me, it, it looks, it could either stop, we don't actually know. So what we can do on our table is just to go back and change our steps. Uh, let's make our start negative one this time. And we're gonna change our step to 0 0.1. And just look very quickly. Now you can see how quickly it shifts down the side. Um, just between that point, between one and zero, how quickly it moves. Um, look, there's a negative 0 0.5 and negative four. And then if I go down negative 0 0.4 and negative five, negative 0 0.2 and negative 10. So you can see it drops quite dramatically very quickly. And so you can actually include one or two coordinates and it just gives the students an idea of how close they can get to the edge of your asymptote here, which is this one here. Okay. Cool, so I obviously did a, a shift for this one just to investigate it, but you can see the shift. It's the same distance between each coordinate as well. So, all right, then here is your hyperbola summary. And of course your domain and range and your X and Y intercept your axes of symmetry. You can use this formula. Um, I, think I found it in Kevin's handbook and study guide series for grade 11. Um, ah, it's such a nice shortcut. I've never seen it done like that before. So that's really handy. A nice way to do it as well to find your C value. All right, fantastic. And then of course you have no turning points because your gradient doesn't actually change um, on the hyperbola. It might feel like it, but it's actually just getting steeper and steeper. Um, so that that is why it doesn't have a turning point. Then of course for your exponential graph. Uh, your grade 10 formula is just a very basic exponential, and then your grade 11 and 12 formula is slightly more complex. Uh, and again, you can do the different investigations for the shifts. So this one we just shifted by three. Um, and here is your summary. Now, something that I wanted to make note of here is remember that A can be positive or negative, but your B can never ever be negative. Okay, so, and, and the reason for that is if you had B as a negative, and in fact, let's actually go in and investigate that because that's quite an interesting one. I haven't made notes on this, so this is all fair at the moment. Um, but if you think about if B was negative two, and we just said to the power of X, right? What's gonna happen to uh, your coordinates here? Let's just make this one for an easy reference. You can see it's going between negative and positive and negative and positive and negative and positive. So your graph is actually just gonna do uh, bigger and bigger shark teeth like so, okay? And, and it's not something we cover in grade 10, 11 or 12. Um, and it, there's no useful point for this type of graph either. So you may as well, uh, but it is a fun exercise to show them why we don't use B as negative, just, um, just to point it out. Okay. And then of course, when your B is between, between zero and one, in other words, it's a fraction, then it goes from this side big to little. And when it is bigger than one, it grows from small to big. Okay. And then of course, your domain and range and your X intercept. And remember that you do have the prime factorization button. And let me just show you quickly how that works. 
So if I just press home, home just takes me back to ball mode. So if we wanted, for example, the prime factors of 87, just randomly, it's not a great example, but it'll do. And then we just say second function and p fact, and that will give us three times 29. So it will help that function specifically will help with solving your exponential um, equations, especially for where x is zero and y is zero as well. All right, so of course, and then your asymptote because it is um, cannot go through a certain axis, which is your y um, asymptote, sorry, your x asymptote, unless it's shifted by q. Okay, awesome. Um, so I did do uh, an example question, which I, I don't know if that's something that you guys would be interested in covering right now. I just did the, the basic steps and this question comes from one of our worksheets as well. I can't remember exactly which one it is. Are there any questions for functions? We all good. Would you like to do this question together? Or do you all want to go stick your heads in the sand and cry? Okay, we've got one vote. Yes, says Fazika. All right, well, Fazika, you're the only one who's voted, so let's do the question. Okay. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so we have the graphs, which is your hyperbola graph here. Uh, I see one vote. And Yasha says also yes. Yeah. Thank you, Yasha. Um, so let's just go through these very quickly. So you've given the graph, which is the hyperbola, which is k over x minus p plus q, and p of x is in x plus c with point a, b as the point intersection between two graphs. You can see them here then. You can see I've used GeoGebra to draw them. So c is uh, negative one and two and is point on the graph h of x. Asymptotes for the hyperbola are x is equal to one, which is this one here, and y is equal to three, which is this one here. Okay. Determine the equation of h of x. So we know from our asymptote equations that p is going to be equal to 1 and q is going to be equal to 3. And we can substitute that in. So that's already given us two out of the three things that we need. Then, of course, we need to find k. And to find k, we just substitute our c value in, which is negative 1 and 2. So 2 is equal to k over negative one minus one again, because uh, you're substituting in your x first, plus three. And then we have, we take the three to the other side becomes negative three. So we've got negative one is equal to k over negative two. So k is equal to two because negative one times negative two is two. And then of course we substitute this back into our formula and we get the solution. Now that we know the formula, we can answer other questions. So the next question says, determine the coordinates of A, the y-intercept of um, H of x. So now when we know that we have the y-intercept, we make our x equal to zero. And it's just a very quick substitution into the graph and we get one. So our A-intercept, or if we go back and look at the um, picture, looks correct, zero and one makes sense. Okay, hence or otherwise, determine the equation of p of x given that p passes through the point half and three. I see this question. Yes, Vizika, that is true. They often forget to write the formula and they need to write the formula to get that last final mark. Um, so it's something that they, they do need to remember um, quite regularly. Okay, so this one says, hence otherwise determine the equation p of x given that p passes through the points half and three. So we have zero and one, okay? And we are going to substitute this into this equation here. So p of x is a straight line here uh, from the original question. Okay, so it goes through a, it goes through b, and we've get, been given a, so we substitute a in, and we can see that it, the y-intercept is one, which we saw previously. So now we have y is equal to mx plus one, and we can substitute the other point, this half and three into our equation and solve for m, which gives us four. So we can see that our p of x formula is four x plus one. And again, as Fazika points out, we need to make sure that our students write that final formula down for that final mark. Okay. Then of course, the next question says determine b, which is the other point of intersection on our graph. So we're looking for this point here. 
So we're going to solve simultaneously. So we have y is equal to 4x plus 1, and we have our hyperbola graph over here, and we just put it in. Now, what I did is I actually typed this into the table mode of the calculator. I took everything to the other side. So you can see I've literally just moved this graph to the, um, to the other side of the table so that it's equal to zero. And now we're looking for the points where x is equal to zero. So we can see x is um, zero. And then if we scroll through the table some more, we can also see x is equal to 1.5. And this is just a nice checking mechanism because obviously you still need to do the algebra in order to get your marks. But to make sure that we've actually achieved that correct, um, we've actually achieved what we were looking for, we can use the table to check. Okay, now of course, x is equal to zero, we already know is our a coordinate. So we only need to find our b coordinate, and that is this three over two, or 1.5 on the table, and we can substitute that in and find seven. Awesome. Uh, determine the equations for the axes of symmetry for h of x. So we know our gradient is plus and minus one, and we can use that q is equal to plus and minus p plus c to find our different equations. I've done the long version. Um, so here you can see it's, well, it's basically the same. So here you can see uh, that our c is two and four. So our two equations are x plus two and negative x plus four. Uh, I've tried to make it accurately. I didn't actually draw this on GeoGebra. I drew this over and above. <laughs> so please forgive my inaccuracy here. Um, but that's sort of where those axes of symmetry should be, and you should be able to see uh, that from the picture. So for which values of x does the graph of h of x not exist? So we can see that this is the point where your x asymptote is, okay? So x is equal to 1 are the values where h of x doesn't exist. In other words, your hyperbola doesn't exist at those two points. All right, sure, this is a long question. Um, <laughs> determine the x and y intercepts of both h of x and p of x. So again, it's just substituting y is equal to zero and solving for x, and substituting x is equal to zero and solving for y. Uh, for this one, a uh, slightly longer methodology. Uh, remember that you need to multiply out your um, denominator and then solve for x that way. And then, of course, your y intercept, which we already knew was 0 and 1 for both of these graphs. But it's always good to repetition and um, to practice this. Then it says, for which values of x is h of x less than or equal to p of x? So where is p of x above h of x? OK, so I just want to draw it in here in red. So where is p of x? bigger than h of x. So we can see p of x is bigger than h of x up to this point. Then h of x is somewhere over here. And then p of x gets bigger again over here. Right, so it's from this point here, from b upwards, and between x is equal to one and x is equal to zero, and where x is greater than three over two. So it's just looking at your graph and knowing um, where it's bigger. You can see the hyperbola here is bigger than your straight line graph. And here your straight line graph is bigger than your hyperbola. But here it's not so obvious because you can't actually see the graph. So you need to know that this graph slides up all the way in order to pick out where it's bigger than the other graph as well. Alrighty. Um, determine the height of h of x above p of x at the point c. So here's c. And we know that the C value is negative one and two. So we need to find the Y coordinate for P. So we substitute negative one into that and we get P is negative three. So now we're doing a distance calculation. So from the um, y, X asymptote to C is two units, right? And from the X asymptote to the, this coordinate is three units. So our total distance is going to be five units. Okay. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Um, I hope that you found this workshop helpful uh, and not too overwhelming.